Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Andy Cotgreave, technical evangelist at Tableau, also board game geek. Welcome to part two of my conversation with Jeff Engelstein, board game designer and professor. Part one was amazing. We were talking about pre-attentive attributes, framing and icons and how they appear in board games and in data visualization. And what you're about to see in part two is all about the boards and how board games and the design of those can teach us things that we could use in our dashboards. This is also going to be a great episode. Part one links are down below. Do go check that one out because it was also amazing. Whether you've watched it or not, here comes part two. Enjoy the show. So, Jeff, I think you wanted to go first with Eclipse. Sure. So this is a, 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 a space game called Eclipse where you're going out and, and trying to conquer the galaxy and create new technologies and stuff like and design new ships. And um, these types of games are typically very complex. Uh, and Eclipse, um, which came out, I probably should have looked it up before I got in here, probably about 10 or 15 years ago, but it just totally kind of blew away the competition because it was, the graphic design on it was so amazing. And just the, the way that it made things simple for the users to understand what was going on and to you know, interpret the data that was, that was out on the field. Um, you know, the, the, what I call the original sin of board games is rules and having to learn <laughs> how to play a game. Uh, you can go to the next slide. That's fine. But, um, the, uh, you know, so anything as a designer that you can do to make things simpler for your players to understand and to deal with, is just one less cognitive load that they need to do. So one of the really, really cool innovations in Eclipse is, um, you can see these cubes here on those tracks. So there's actually three main resources in Eclipse. There's, there's money, which is orange, there's technology, which is pink, and there's industry, which is brown. And as you conquer those hexagons, those hexagonal tiles, actually, maybe we go back to the previous one that we talked <laughs> you off of that. But those hexagonal tiles, you put things on, you know, to, uh, you, you mark planets that you take over and those produce those resources. And in previous versions of this genre of game, when you would do production, you'd have to go back and count the number of planets that you had and add up all of the different things. So the information was diffused all over the map. So in Eclipse though, as you take these cubes off and put them on the board, it reveals those numbers. So all you have to do to see what it is, is just read off those numbers. So just by looking here in this situation, you would get 10 orange, six pink and eight brown and boom, you're done, right? So there was a task again, it didn't take a long, you know, maybe, you know, it would take 30 seconds or a minute or something to add up all your stuff. So, you know, it wasn't a huge, huge activity, but every little thing that you can do to go from, uh, you know, to, to go from a, a 30 second or one minute activity to a two second activity is going to free up the player's brains to enjoy the game more and to keep things moving and to make things shorter. Um, and they did a similar thing with those discs down the bottom. You can see those, the discs in the orange. And that's as you conquer hexagons, you put those discs in the center to show that you own it. And, um, but as your empire gets bigger, it costs more and more to maintain. So they use this the, in consistency of color. They use the orange color to represent money. So it, it, now you'd have to spend 10, you see the negative 10 or you'd have to lose $10 uh, mm -hmm. at, at every turn you lose 10 orange. Um, so, you know, you're making, in this case, you're making 10 and you're losing 10. So you're kind of in stasis right now. You're not accumulating any additional orange. And then above it, you can see the technology track and that's all key pink. So, you know, they just have a lot of these types of affordances that make it very easy for the players to understand what's going on. And, um, and it, it, sorry, you were going to move on to a different yeah. point, but I just, just think generally there, you, you know, it's amazing those innovations. It might only take 30 seconds, but Eclipse is an epic space game, right? It's going to take you hours to play. So just, again, like, like we're trying to do with data communication, any of the little burrs we can shave off, they actually make, to make a flowing experience, it's hugely important. Um, yeah, so yeah absolutely. Uh, you yeah. know, these, these little, little differences can make a big, uh, make a big difference, especially if you get a lot of them add up over the course of it. So, yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that they really lean on heavily is shape. So um, like, here's a sample tile in Eclipse. Uh, and um, I talked about the disc that you put in the center, uh, but you can see that other funky shape <laughs> that's kind of around there. Mm -hmm. And when you discover that tile, when you, when you explore it, um, that's, that means that there's some kind of a mystery on that tile and you, and you have to put a specially shaped token on there. So you can see the tokens in the middle that you put on it and how it's keyed to the shape on the, the board. So, so the tile itself immediately by having that white outline 
most of the tiles just have the circle in the middle, which is where those discs go that were in the previous slide. So that's another yeah. thing where they fit perfectly in there as, as a guide. Um, but also it's like, whoa, what's that shape? And it's a reminder to put those on there. It also has the happy effect that you can't put a, that it also covers up the, the circle, the disc circle that's there. And the, by rule, you're not allowed to place one of your discs there until the discovery tile is resolved. And hmm. by simply covering up the, the circle, it's, it acts as sort of a mnemonic aid to that. So you, there's just no place to put the disc. Even if you go to put the disc, it's like, oh, the disc is under this tile. And it's, oh yeah, yeah, right. I can't put one of it. Whereas if it was next to it, which certainly could have been done, you could put the circle yeah. next to the tile. You wouldn't have that same kind of reminder. And, and in that one over on the, um, the far right there, um, this is a track where there's two different types of tiles there. There's victory tiles on the bottom, those, those kind of shield ones which with the number one, which is what you draw when you win battles. And then there's also diplomacy tiles, which are kind of that weird cutout shape. Um, and you've got, in this case, you've got a track where you place those and you can put, you've got three spots for the victory tiles, but only, but four spots for the diplomacy tiles. And so rather than, um, uh, you know, try to explain in the rules what it is and everything, this track encapsulates that very clearly, that there's one spot where you can only put a diplomacy tile and three spaces where you could put either of them. And so, you know, just the use of shape throughout, uh, consistency of use of shape, consistency of the use of color, and, and actually, you know, having stuff hidden or, or exposed when you can actually use it is really just brilliant, brilliantly guides the player through a very yeah. complex experience, but by really shaves off all those edges. Amazing. Um, I haven't played Eclipse. It's a massive game. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, uh, an interesting quick story about it. It's, it's not as massive as you think. I mean, you can get it done in a couple of hours, but I was talking, I interviewed the designer uh, and the graphic designer of the game, and I kind of asked for their genesis, the idea of, of how to do this. And, you know, some games, there's, there's like the mechanics of the game, the designers come up first, and some games, the theme is first of how, what they want it to be about. They told me that for, for, for this specific design, the first idea that the, that the designer had was for the graphic design, that these little things, that was the motivation. Wow. It was like, you know this would be really kind of a cool thing to put into a game. And they actually built the game around the graphic design. So it was really, you know, not something that was put in later, but was built in from the ground up. Wow. That's amazing. That, yeah. That's, that's great. That makes me triply interested to go see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, my first choice of board game uh, is Terraforming Mars. So this game is currently ranked the fourth best game of all time on board game geek, which is, uh, the online resource you want to go to if you want to get into board games. About 25,000 ranked games on there. So being number four is something quite special. It's probably my all-time favorite game right okay. now. I've well, played this I will, so I will just jump in and give my, my daughter, actually, who is a game developer uh, also. She designed the card game version of this, uh, huh? which was just uh, just launched on Kickstarter. So, uh, Did well, she? I'm, I'm really... Yeah. Yeah, I'm very excited about that game. There oh, wow. I did not realize. I thought I assumed it was just by the, the Frick Studios team. No. Nope, okay. Nope, well, they, well, there that's you go. That's her. It's all her. That's great. Oh, good for her. <laughs> um, so, uh, this game is by uh, Jacob Frick uh, And in this game, you are competing. You are a CEO competing with rival corporations to make Mars habitable and build the best corporate empire. Yes, you've got to mine for resources. You've got to take what you can from asteroids and meteors. You've got to create oceans, cities, and forests. Never has the destruction of a planetary ecosystem been <laughs> such fun. I love it. Do you like this game, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I enjoy it. It's not as high on my list as it is for many others, but I, right. I certainly I will play it when asked for sure. Yeah, cool. Uh, hopefully we can do that one day. Um, so here's the board, right? Now, the first time anybody looks at one of these uh, boards, it can be kind of overwhelming, right? Uh, you know, I, as an expert, can look at this board and I'm just familiar with the language. And in fact, um, I, I played Terraforming Mars with my wife uh, in order to take these photos just a few days ago. So, hey, uh, board gaming as part of research for if data could talk, it's a win. Except she whooped me, <laughs> which was less good. But anyway, so uh, on the board, uh, this is the board state at the start. And then by the end of the game, it looks a little bit like this. Uh, so what you're seeing is uh, green uh, represents forests. The gray ones are cities. The blues are oceans. There are other tiles as well. And then they're identified by the person who owns them. Uh, the progress indicators have all got to the end. So there's now enough oxygen on the planet. The temperature's high and all the oceans are seeded. Uh, so that's when the game ends. Uh, and then you've got various bits and bobs around. Now, 
once you're familiar with the language of the game, it's all really easy to see and read this progress, right? And, you know, it, it is an, an amazing game. Um, and that's how we know the game ended, right? The progress indicators all got to the end. And I wanted to call this game out because it is a masterpiece and it is hugely popular uh, in the gaming community. But there are some interesting choices in the design of this game. You know, it does get criticized for not being the most beautiful of all games, right? Now, for example, progress is measured on an oxygen meter. So when, it, when you've got here, no more oxygen can be added to the atmosphere. It's also monitored on a thermometer, on a temperature gauge. So you've got to try and get the temperature to minus eight and by a pile of ocean hexes, which when that runs out, there's enough water on the planet. And, and it is one of these things, you know, when you look at this, you, you can see dashboard principles, there's flow, there's regions, there's icons. But I always wondered, why did they not put the gauges next to each other in two vertical uh, lines? Now, I actually, I, I can think of reasons why they didn't. But, you know, you sit and you think maybe that would have been something to ease, just one little thing to make the uh, consumption of this sort of dashboard board game a little bit easier. A little bit easier. So I, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on that in a moment, Jeff. But I also want to, um, I think you touched on it again uh, a moment ago, board game design is a really interesting challenge because you also want players to think they're terraforming Mars. So you have to encode the information, card icons, resource icons, annotations, uh, in such a way that the mechanics of the game are apparent. But you also have to make it, in this case, look like Mars. Because, you know, if, if you took all the graphics off this board, the game would still function, but you wouldn't have that immersive experience um so I, I love this game it's design i mean I, it's just great i'm not going to really criticize i'm not going to criticize it at all um but jeff what, what, what do you when designing boards you know what do you recommend you got your game designers think about and how are, are there any data related data dashboards lessons you've learned that would apply that to well yeah i mean it's it's all the classic lessons from graphic design that apply, you know, as, as well as with dashboards, which is, you know, having a, a number of different reads, you know, so at the surface level, what is your eye drawn to first? And, you know, how do you distinguish different areas and what's important and what's not important? So, you know, there's ways you can play with color and, and a lot of different subtle nature, you know, subtle things that, that will make sense. I, and I, I agree. I think that, you know, the terraforming Mars, you know, the, the game is really solid, uh, really good, but, you know, there's certainly, I, I think graphically they could have made some different choices. I think the iconography isn't fantastic. Um, it can be sometimes very confusing to, to get, understand the exact abilities of what all the cards are. You know, I, I particularly find like the, what is it, the titanium icon? I was one of the icons that drives me nuts, right? Um, you got steel and titanium as a star, is all kinds of different things. Um, also yeah. just, you know, uh, it's just hard at a glance to see what you're doing. So you can see like there's that player board there, which is a lot of, there's, there's a whole secondary market of people coming out with upgraded components to make the game, you know, easier to play and a little bit easier on the eyes. Well, in fact, um, he, he, yeah, here you go. Yeah. Here is, here is, here is a game board with the uh, plastic overlay that I had to spend quite a significant amount of money to yeah. improve the laying out. But uh, yeah, a, a lot of other information on the playing board as well. Um, the, yeah. uh, the, this, by the way, is, is the end state of the game. This is a two-player game. As you can see, the gin and tonic is there for scale. It takes up quite a lot of space. On one yeah, and it's just stuff <laughs> everywhere. There's cards yeah. everywhere and stuff like that. And yeah, but there's even like little simple stuff. I mean, in my in my book on on game prototyping, I've got like a whole section about designing your score track. You can see like here mm -hmm. with the score track, they've got different yellow, uh, you know, yellow spaces to kind of help the players out that indicate every fives, multiples of five, and stuff like that. Uh, you know, this is not a great one too because if two people are in the same space, uh, it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to fit in the same space. So it could have been a little mm. bit better from that. Maybe there would have been better if the discs instead of cubes so that they could be easier stacked if you're in the same space. There's a lot of those kind of considerations that go into board games. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Right, now, Terraforming Mars. On this board, we have a map and um, you don't get very far in the board game world without thinking about maps. Uh, so, Jeff, you wanted to talk about... Uh, yes. So Max this game, which was actually, Halloween. you talked about Board Game Geek, about Terraforming Mars is number four. I don't know where this is now, but Twilight Struggle was the number one game for quite a while. For a long time, uh, yeah. So this is a game about the Cold War. And, um, you know, so again, you're, uh, you're clearly, you know, got a, a map of the world there um, with the U.S. and the USSR highlighted. Um, as, as those are the, this is a two-player game. Those are the, the two uh, different players' uh, factions. 
And then you've got these different regions of the world with the little boxes. And I love this map as an example, because I feel that it, it, it talks about you know, the, the different levels when you approach it and, and how, as you kind of zoom in, that it gets closer. So for example, when you first look at the main, main map there, you'll see that there's different colors. And you can also see like you've got, you know, kind of the light greens and, and the dark greens for Central and South America, you know, the purples are different ones. So immediately your, your eye knows, oh, there's groups, there's groupings, there's, there's sets of spaces. Um, the next thing that you may notice as you start to kind of focus on it, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, there's sets of spaces, but some of them have these white headers and some of them have these darker purple headers, okay? Um, you know, and, and yeah, you, you're in the zoomed in part, but even on the main map, right? Even on, even when you're far away, that kind of catches your eye a little bit and mm -hmm. you're like, oh, okay, there must be something different there. And the difference there is that the, the darker purple spaces uh, are, are what are called battleground uh, spaces. Those are more important in terms of determining control and, and the victory of the game is ultimately around the battleground nations, which are, are, are the purple and, and having the dark color, um, for the, the more important spaces is a really smart move. It, it draws your eye to it. So you can see like, if you look now, like in the corner where you got France versus Austria versus Italy, right? So you have the Austrian and Italy ones. Um, so Italy is a battleground country. So you've got the dark purple and then the red highlight for the, the number of, uh, the, 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 that's called the stability of it. Whereas Austria is, is with the white and the yellow. So there's less contrast there right off the bat. So again, your eye is naturally going to be drawn to those, uh, you know, to those more important spaces. Um, and then on an even kind of more subtle level, the way that you play this game is you actually put influence tokens, number tokens in those boxes. Oh, there you go. Beautiful. Uh, and um, you always put, you know, the U.S. always puts their space, their, their numbers in the uh, left-hand box and the uh, USSR places their numbers in the right-hand box. And that mirrors on a high level, the overall board has the US on the left side and the USSR on the right side. So there's just sort of this natural flow in the overall board that it's from, you know, the blue US over to the red USSR, as well as in each individual space is like a little mini mirror of the big map that, so you look at it at a glance and you know, as a USS, USA player or the USSR player, exactly where to look and what your, um, you know, what the numbers look like. And you can see also here, again, the use of contrast is if a player controls has sufficient influence to control, then they use the bold side of their influence. Like East Germany there has the, it, there's one US influence, but there's enough with the four Soviet influence that they flip it to the red side. Mm -hmm. And that shows that they've now got a, a, a higher level of control. And so it draws your eye to, to the right spots. It's, it, I, I, I don't know how, which you've played the game, I've played maybe four oh, I love or five times. Yeah, yeah it, it is absolutely amazing. And, and I think in terms of this conversation, what's amazing about it is in some ways that map's not really very attractive by modern standards. And yet it's just, it's perfect, right? It, it's just perfectly graphically designed. And, you know, this game is one of the most immersive I think I've ever played, right? I, you know, you really get that sense of a Cold War struggle. Uh, so wonderful, wonderful game. Um, great, right. The last one I wanted to talk about um, was Wingspan by Elizabeth Hargreaves. Um, and partly I wanted to talk about this one because board games are not just about space and war and combat. Um, there is a board game about every single topic under the sun you could imagine. And this is such a great game. This has been one of the biggest games in the, in the hobby in the last couple of years. And in this game, you are trying to attract the best collection of birds to the habitat, the three different habitats on your playing map. You do that over several rounds. And as you play more birds, you get more powers. And as you get more powers, you can play more birds. And so it's called, it's what's called an engine builder. And it's just that the design is gorgeous. Uh, you, you know, the, uh, the illustrations themselves are exquisite. But again, you can look at different, different players' habitats. You can see how many eggs they've got. That's sort of the currency of the game. How much progress have they made within the habitats? You know, because there's more birds, it's very, very clear. You know, again, icons, but when you look at the cards in this game, I mean, the illustrations are just superb, but all this information becomes really easy for a player to read and from across the table, right? You know, the brown cards activate at a specific part in a, in a round. And so you can see this person's going to get 
a lot of those brand powers uh, triggering all at the same time. So, uh, yeah, living wingspan. Um, wingspan is great. One of the weird just, and it's a really weird critique, but I'm just going to throw it out there, uh, is those little eggs. Love the eggs. Uh -huh. um, but you see that they're all the different colors. The colors mean nothing in the game. Uh, which always kind of throws people off a little bit, uh, you, know, yeah. you know, so, I mean, they did it as an aesthetic choice because you know, obviously the eggs, you know, Robin eggs or, you know, all the different birds have different colored eggs, but I just think it's interesting that they kind of went that way aesthetically, even though functionally in the game, you, you think it means something, but it doesn't. Yeah, that is, uh, is yes, really fascinating choice. And uh, they actually added different color eggs in expansions and deluxe packs, again, for no reason other than people wanted purple eggs right uh, so sure uh yeah uh so yeah wingspan phew well jeff there you go what have we talked about we've done dice framing iconography maps encoding information dashboards it's literally been a lesson in data visualization but also board game design uh so i think everybody watching you can now go and play some board games and assign it to your boss saying i'm learning how to be a data analyst it sounds, <laughs> sounds like a win right, jeff absolutely <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Jeff, uh, thanks so much for being part of the show. Have we missed anything out? Is there anything else you think we've completely uh, missed or we could do as a different episode? I would be delighted to come back. This is, I, this is a, an endlessly uh, fascinating topic for me. And I, I think that there's, you know, the way all these different disciplines connect is 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 really cool. So I, yeah. I'm happy to come back anytime and keep talking about this stuff. All right. Oh, well, so let us know in the comments uh what categories you think we might have missed what games you like but you didn't mention <laughs> monopoly uh yeah. we didn't mention monopoly game design has come on since 1933 even though monopoly was a good graphic design actually as well uh all right so uh finally jeff where can people find you how can uh, we go and dig into a bit more of jeff Engelstein? um probably the best bet was to find me on twitter i'm uh, at g Engelstein, which is g-e-n-g-e-l S-T-E-I-N. Uh, so I do a lot of talk there about, about game design and psychology and, and graphic design and stuff like that. So that's, that's probably the best bet. And links will be appearing wherever they appear yes. as we finish this out. So uh, thank you, Jeff, for watching. If you want more about board games and data visualization, I highly recommend you go and check out the latest Iron Quest recap. Uh, Iron Quest is a project run by Sarah Bartlett where she's trying to help people you know, develop their skills, possibly to enter IronViz. Uh, and in the last most recent theme, they did it on data visualizations about board games. Oh, yes. Uh, so you can see the recap video with her and Kevin Flerledge. That's uh, really good fun. We'll link to that as well. And with that, Jeff, thanks again. Thank you, everybody who's watched. Let us know which board games you love. And we'll see you next time on If Data Could Talk. Goodbye.